Yo, what's going on, family? Welcome to a brand new episode of Tariq Radio. And I am your host, I am Tariq Nasheed. Glad to have everybody tuning in. We're going to chop up some great game on today's show. I'm going to do a review of the movie that a lot of people are talking about, The Bird Box. But what we're going to do now, family, we're going to take a real quick commercial break. So let everybody know that we're in the house. We're doing our thing. Let them know to come on in here and join us right here on Tariq Radio. So y'all don't move a muscle, family. And we'll be right back after these messages. Yo, you still ain't getting women? Really? Come on, son. You need to go to badboymembership.com and step up your game. What's up, y'all? It's your boy, Mr. Locario, the bad boy of the dating game. And I'm telling you that if you really want to attract beautiful women, you need to go to badboymembership.com. This is where you get 45 through 90 minute step-by-step dating advice tutorials every month. Just sign up, follow the advice, and you'll get the woman you want. Go to badboymembership.com. That's badboymembership.com. Attention parents and teachers, are you tired of your children listening to music that glamorizes drug use and negative stereotypes? If so, check out Gifted and Lit. Gifted and Lit is an award-winning educational program that uses hip-hop to teach children mathematics, science, self-esteem, and much, much more. This is a black-owned product that needs to be supported. Go to giftedandlit.com to order their program today. Remember, that's giftedandlit.com. Yo, are you a fan of personal development and self-help? Loving hip-hop? You love to listen to podcasts? Well, check out my man Poe at popolitikin.com. This was founded in 2008. Poe Politikin is a self-help meets hip-hop brand. And with each interview, they teach the babies and they share success secrets with you, the listener. Past guests of the show include Yo Gotti, Currency, MC Light, Dead Prez, Rashida, Gorgeous Dre, and so many more special people out there in the game. So Paul Politician has featured over 500 guests. Subscribe to his podcast on iTunes and listen to their most recent interview with rap lot founder Jay Prince and rapper Big Poo from Lil Brother. So check them out right now. Go to their website popolitikin.com and follow them on social media at popolitikin. Yo, cupcake season is right around the corner, family, and you need to get your fragrance game all up in order. So you need to check out ashkicking.com. That's a black-owned business that sells all-natural health and beauty products, and it also has fragrance products. You can get beauty products such as body butter, hair moisturizer, face moisturizer, unique incense burners, incense sticks, scented candles, and so much more. So again, you need to check out ashkicking, that's K-I-C-K-I-N, The year is 2079. The futuristic nation of New Albion has been created to maintain a new racial apartheid system. There is a planned genocide that is going to target the nation's black population. A small group of black revolutionaries band together to launch guerrilla warfare attacks against their oppressors. Do they fail? Or do they succeed? Find out the answer by reading the book, Avoid the Machines. The new novel by author Scotty Vasco. Avoid the Machines. Now available on Amazon and BarnesandNoble.com. You are now tuning in to the king of games, Tariq Elite on Tariq Elite Radio. I am delivered! What's up? We're back. We're back, family. Glad to have y'all tuning in. Oh, let me turn my Mac and music down. Welcome back to the show, family. Glad to have y'all tuning in this week. It's a holiday week. A lot of people are celebrating Kwanzaa, Christmas, Feliz Navidad, whatever you're celebrating. Happy holiday to you. First, I want to thank everybody who came out to the Mink Slide concert in Atlanta this past weekend. We had an absolute ball down in Atlanta. It was off the damn chain in Atlanta. We had big fun. Everybody really enjoyed the concert. 
We had a blast. We had a lot of big fun. We're going to bring it to some other cities near you soon. Also, my L.A. people, you guys can get the Mink Slide album, vinyl. You can get it on vinyl at um, Amoeba Music. They have the album at the Amoeba Music Store. And also, if you're in L.A., they can they got all the Hidden Colors DVDs there, too. So you can go to e- Amoeba Records on Sunset Boulevard and get the Mink Slide vinyl album. And you can get all the Hidden Colors DVDs in 1804. All my L.A. people, go up there tomorrow and get yours right now. But yeah, uh, they want us to come to Washington, D.C. with the Mink Slide concert and then ultimately ultimately New York. We just got to find a venue. But, you know, promoters hit me up. Let's see what we can do. Y'all promoters hit me up and let's see what we can do. Let's politic. You dig? So, man, we, we got a lot to talk about on tonight's show. And also get your North Sentinel Island shirts at HiddenColorsFilm.com, HiddenColorsFilm.com. All right, so let's jump right into it, family. How about that? Let's just jump right into it. You dig? Let's jump right into it. There's a movie everybody's talking about right now. It's called Bird Box. It's on Netflix. And I advise people, if you have not seen the film, just kind of wait before you listen to this broadcast because I want I would like for you to see the film first because I'm going to give away a lot of spoilers in the movie. We're going to be breaking it down. I'm going to be giving away a lot of spoilers from the movie. You dig? I'm going to be giving away a lot of spoilers so don't trip. So If you don't want to know what the spoilers are, just kind of mute this. Wait till you hear the playback after you see the movie. But it's on Netflix, so you everybody has Netflix. Everybody has Netflix, so you guys should you should have seen it already. If not, watch it tonight. Now, over in my chat room, everybody in the chat room, if you've seen the movie, could you please press one? All my people in the chat room who has seen the movie, can you press one? Let me see how many people in here have seen the movie. So I'll know how many people who's going to be on. Okay, a lot of y'all saw it. Okay, so we're going to break this thing down. So Bird Box is a supernatural thriller horror movie. It kind of has that M. Night Shyamalan vibe. It, it reminded me somewhat of the movie The Happening. It kind of had that vibe to it. It's a post-apocalyptic type of film starring Sandra Bullock. Um, L- Lil Rel is in it, the brother from um, Get Out. Great actor. Um, it's a few people. John Malkovich, he's in it. So this movie is very interesting. See, you understand, and, and when people put movies out, there's always messages in there. There's always subliminal messages. There's always sub-messages. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to have on the tinfoil koofy. I got the tinfoil koofy on, you dig? So there's some things that we're going to have to ask questions about with the tinfoil koofy. You dig? But there's a lot of things, a lot of symbolisms in there that I want people to catch. Now, in the movie, basically, the premise is, the hook is, people can't go outside without covering their eyes because there's an evil spirit slash demon slash unknown entity that will reach your soul, get into your brain, and make you want to commit suicide. The so-called entity spirit demon, it's supposed to make you see your darkest fears, your darkest regrets. It, It really gets into the bowels of your soul if you see this entity, okay? And it makes people commit suicide. It tells you to commit suicide. Now, that's heavy right there. Now, that's heavy right there because... 
this this entity is reaching your soul and they say the eyes are the window to the soul so it enters the soul through the eyes and the eye window correlation they kept having that throughout the film if you notice they had to cover all the windows in the house when they got in the car they had to black out the windows Remember when um, they were at the airport, I think that was at the airport, it was some white lady bashing her head into a window committing suicide. So that window correlation was always there. That window to the soul metaphor, that was always there. Okay? So the thing is, so they had to cover their eyes whenever they went outside and you had these people running around they're, they're not knowing what's going on. Early in the movie, now I want, a lot of y'all probably didn't catch this. In the movie, they were talking about this might be some kind of chemical bio warfare by North Korea. Did y'all catch that? They made this one comment about it could be North Korea doing some kind of chemical bio attack. All right, so I caught that. So there was supposed to be an alleged bio attack that was just in the air, in nature. And you had all these people scrambling around trying to get away from whatever was out there. And the thing is, people who were considered insane, they were somewhat unaffected by this demonic entity people who were they they made a comment about some people at some insane asylum and people who were who had some kind of mental illness or mentally insane they were not negatively affected by this demonic thing and the demons would pretty much talk through them the demons would talk to them and and get them to do work for them and get people to take their blindfolds off got it Somebody said it's supposed to be Tachulu from the H.C. Lovecraft novels. It sounded like that to a certain degree. So you got these people, particularly the white women. And I want y'all to understand the movie was directed by a white woman. It was the book is from a book. The book was written by a white man. But the protagonist was was a white woman which was Sandra Bullock. So a lot of this movie, and I want y'all to peep this, this was really a lesson to white women on how to survive when the system of white supremacy breaks down. I want y'all to look at it like that. This was a lesson to white women on what to do when the system of white supremacy breaks down. Because all of these apocalyptic type movies it's always a metaphor for systematic white supremacy. Whenever there's a breakdown in society, what do we do to maintain control? And this goes, let's jump into real life. Let's jump into real life. Whenever there's a natural disaster, you notice while Negroes are out here grabbing flat screen TVs and Jordans and jewelry and nigga shit, the white supremacists are out there patrolling, they're getting guns, they're circling their wagons, just like down in New Orleans, just like down over there in North Carolina. Recently, you had literally white supremacist militia groups patrolling neighborhoods. They're going for guns and food. They know what it is. So in these movies, there's always uh, this threat and the protagonists are white and they have to learn how to survive as white people. There's always that racial undertone. You understand that? And even when the people got into the room, when they got into this one house, they were going to different houses, trying to find somebody's house. So they, a bunch of people hold up in one house. They got held up in one house. It was um, a couple of white people. It was John Malkovich. It was an older white lady, Sandra Bullock. It was a black man. His name was Tom. 
And there was another black man, Lil Rel. I think his name was Charlie. And there was a gay Asian man in there. And so they had the whole, they had everything but a black female in there. They had everything but a black female in there. And that's very big because, you know, black woman is the mother of civilization. And these films are all about reestablishing civilization. Let's get deep with it. All of these movies, The Walking Dead, all these movies, it's all about reestablishing civilization. So they didn't have a black woman in there. The black woman is the mother of civilization. So how do you reestablish civilization without the mother of civilization? How can a white woman do this? This had to be a white woman empowerment movie. You couldn't have a black woman in there being on some weak shit because it wouldn't look right. This was a white woman empowerment movie. You cannot have a black woman in a movie acting like she's weak when some shit is going down. It's just unrealistic. So they just had to omit a black woman altogether. So they had a couple of black men in there who were the main characters. Okay. And now, Sandra Bullock's character, she was pregnant. They never said who she was pregnant by. It's obvious, I, I don't think they did. I don't think they said who she was pregnant by, but obviously it was the white man. But I don't remember them mentioning who she was pregnant by. So she's running around pregnant. She's about to give birth any moment. So you had the brother, this big swole buff brother named Tom, literally Tom's, Uncle Tom. So he's the big black buck savior. You know, he's running in and, you know, he's, uh, they had him playing what I call, well, well, my man Gus Renegade had this term, the John Henry role. The old John Henry, that's an old slave legend of this big old black slave who outran a train. There's always been legends on black people who sacrificed their lives to show how strong and how agile they are. So they had the big old plantation Negro running around. And this is another thing they do. In these movies, they either they either have the black male as a big super buck, or they'll have him as extremely weak and bucking his eyes. And they had both in this one. And with Lil Rel, his character was bucking the eyes a little bit. He was he was a scared Negro. He was, oh, Lord, we just can't go outside now. You know, he was bucking them eyes a little bit. And also in these movies, whenever you have these supernatural type of films, they'll have the black person as the very superstitious person. The black folks know all about the spirits. You know, it's just like in Green Mile you, you, with, with Michael Clark Duncan, that, that, that magical, spiritual, sacrificial Negro who knows all about the spirits. Who you better not go in there. That's the portal to the devil. You know, that type of thing. So, Lorel's character was explaining what kind of spirits they were. So, he, he knew. So, what's interesting, the Tom dude, immediately when he saw Sandra Bullock, the white woman, the middle-aged pregnant white woman, he flirted with her. He trying to get some pussy. So they had him as the thirsty plantation buck already. He's he's already campaigning and flirting with the pregnant middle-aged white woman. So right there, like, okay. So because they don't mind that. They don't mind giving the black man the white woman who's already quote unquote flawed. She's flawed. She's older and she's pregnant, and we don't know who the daddy is. So, brothers, you can have that. So the audience wouldn't trip on that because she's already flawed. See, they don't mind giving a black man a white woman in the movie if the white woman is flawed. There's always something wrong or something off with the white woman. Just like that movie Black Snake Moan. They didn't mind the, 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 the white girl fucking brothers because she was a nymphomaniac. 
she was sick, she had a disease. You know, it was that type of thing. They don't mind giving you the white woman who's flawed. Something wrong with the white woman. So, so this brother was campaigning for Sandra Bullock. He's flirting with her. And eventually, you know, they had a, they started to get into a sexual relationship after she had the baby and they start living together and all this shit. They survived for about five years. And, and I'm jumping forward a little bit. And another thing, on a side note, five years has, has gone by in this post-apocalyptic society. And this nigga had the freshest fucking haircut. The brother had the freshest haircut. I'm like, who's fading this nigga up? This nigga had 360 waves. I'm like, nigga, where are you getting the grease? I mean, how you fading your shit up like this, brother? <laughs> I'm like, come on, y'all got to make this thing realistic. So let's go back. So they're, they're in the house and they go get some food. They go to, they paint a car, they paint the windows of a car, then they drive to a grocery store using GPS. This is the grocery store that um, Rail works at. Lil Rail works at. So they go there and there's a demon in the freezer or some shit. And then Lil Rail, he's bucking his eyes, he's scared, and then he decides to sacrifice his life. He goes in there and gets himself killed deliberately to save the white people. So I want y'all to notice both of the characters, the black, both of the black men sacrifice themselves. Fast forward again. The the buff brother, when they were living in the house, him and Sandra Bullock's character, some some crazy folks came in to kill them. So Sandra Bullock and the kids ran into the woods, and the brother sacrificed himself. He took his blindfold off and looked into the spirit of the demon and so he could kill some of these other crazy folks so that Sandra Bullock's character can get away. So he sacrificed himself. So they had two sacrificial Negroes in the movie. And look at the messages they sent. See, this is the message. A good Negro is a Negro who will sacrifice himself for white people. That's what a good Negro is. And you notice in a lot of these movies, these sci-fi, paranormal type of movies, they always got the scared, sacrificial Negro. The only time he gets courage is when he's doing something to save white people. Just like Star Wars and Finn. He's bucking his eyes through the whole movie, but the minute white people get in danger, <gasps> he fighting everybody. Hell, it, truth be told, let's look at I Am Legend. I Am Legend is the same way at the end of the movie. I think they had alternative endings, but remember, Will Smith, his character in one of the endings killed himself and the zombies so that the other white and Latino people could survive. So they always have us as the magical, sacrificial Negro. Now in the, let, let's backtrack a little bit in this movie. In the movie, they had the gay Asian guy who some people tried to say he sacrificed himself, but he didn't. There was a scene where he wanted to look at some video monitors to kind of detect the heat sensing of the demons around the house. So he he volunteered to look at this monitor. Now, he didn't know he was going to die or not. It was a gamble, but he ended up killing himself. And that wasn't really a sacrifice. That was more of a gamble. So he didn't sacrifice himself like the brothers. The brothers deliberately knew they were going to die and they sacrificed themselves for the white people. But again, with the Asian man sacrificing or, or, or gambling on his life, it was nothing for them to take him out in the movie because, again, there was already some sort of almost anti-Asian thing in there with the whole Korea thing. So they already established, you know, this, this ain't Asian friendly, by the way. Now, the thing is, Machine Gun Kelly was in the movie, the, the white rapper Machine Gun Kelly. He was in there, and there was a Latina chick in there. And this was very interesting. Him and the Latina chick were in there fucking, and, you know, they were kind of messing around with each other. And him and the Latina chick snuck away and, and stole the car and ran off and just disappeared and left them stranded. Now, that was very interesting. That was very interesting. 
the message was in this movie, because again, this is a white female empowerment movie. This movie is telling white women how to survive in case the system of white supremacy breaks down. And it's telling them, you can't really depend on the white man. What do you do as a white woman to survive and ensure your children will be white in the system of white supremacy? Because the message was, a lot of these white women couldn't trust the white males either because the white males will run off with one of these Latinas or one of these other people. So that was very interesting. That Machine Gun Kelly ran off with the Latina chick. Now, there was another white woman who came to the house. It was another pregnant white woman who showed up to the house. They let her in. Her name was Olympia. She's a, a real chuck, a uh, real overweight white woman who was pregnant. And Olympia, she ended up, she died, she got killed. Well, she, you know, she saw the demon and ended up killing herself. And after she had a baby, and Sandra Bullock ended up raising both of the children. But going back to Olympia, and another thing, look at the name Olympia, that name. So these names were very interesting. Olympia. That's the name of Alexander the Great's mother when we look at it from a historic standpoint. And Alexander the Great, that's somebody who's really revered in Western culture. Historians look at him as being very significant in the development of quote unquote Western, i.e. white culture. So her name being Olympia, don't get lost on that. Do not get lost on that. There's a reason why they name shit certain things. Because remember, this movie is all about reestablishing white culture in an apocalypse. After an apocalypse, how do you reestablish white supremacy? So Olympia was having a conversation with Sandra Bullock's character, and she was... You know, Olympia was an overweight white girl. She was saying, oh my God, I've been so privileged and I'm so weak and I've been so spoiled. My parents have done everything for me. That was a very, very important conversation she was having. She was sending a message. Yeah, she was acting dingy for a reason. They had her talking about how privileged she was. Oh, I'm so privileged. I'm so weak. My, my parents have done everything for me. I don't know how to survive. So could you please? Yes, yeah, she said this. These are her words. She was saying this. So she told Sandra Bullock, please, can you please promise if something happens to me, could you please take care of my baby? If you please. So she was pleading with Sandra because she knew it was over for her. She knew she was weak. She knew the system of white supremacy had broken down. And that was very, very strong in that movie. I want y'all to really catch that. What she was saying, now that the system is broken down, I don't have a, I'm too weak to do anything without this system helping me. The system of white supremacy is gone, so there, I, I can't do it. So I'm gonna, I'm not gonna survive, but you're strong. So when something happens to me, I want you to, could you take care of my children? That was heavy right there. That was very heavy. So again, this is them breaking down what to do when white supremacy breaks down. You gotta buck up, you gotta be strong. And they had the good Negroes, and again, Tom, you know, the, they were the good ones. They're not like the others. And they said, look, you can even, you can have sex with these folks. You can do all this with them. You can be friends with them. But at the end of the day, you have to survive. As a white woman, you have to learn how to survive and take care of your children and make sure they're good. And you have to toughen up. 
and you have to try to take emotions out of it. In the movie, she didn't name her children. She just called them boy and girl. That was very important. Now, one of the reasons why she did that, it was two things. One thing, for her to have less of an emotional attachment, I think, for her to think more logically. Another thing, I think she didn't name give the kids names because the spirit the spirit will try to deceive people to take off their mask by calling their name. So I think the fact that she didn't give them names, the spirit couldn't call them or something. So that might be something with this. But the thing is, with the black characters, like I said, the black characters are always the either the weakest, they're the John Henrys, they're the plantation bucks, I mean, they're either the weakest, the, the groveling Negro, or they're the strongest. Just like in the Living Dead movies, or the, the Living Dead TV show. I haven't watched Living Dead in a while, but they always got the weak black character or the extra strong sacrificial buck. I remember on Walking Dead, the last time I saw it a few seasons ago, they had the black preacher on there. Y'all remember him? That black preacher was always crying and groveling and weak and scared. <laughs> He's scary as hell. And then they had the big old buff Negroes sacrificing themselves for the white people. And even in the first season, they had that big old coon T-Dog. I hated him. Just big, swole, buff, cornfed nigga for nothing. Just big, useless nigga. They beating him up. They're calling him a nigga. He's bucking his eyes through the whole season. And basically sacrificing himself for the white characters. They got these niggas babysitting. Eyes watching the babies, you know. So they've always had that dynamic, the weakest and the strongest. But the thing is, they had to have the dynamic of the white woman being in control. She was in control. She had to be stern. She couldn't be weak. She couldn't depend on the white male. And because she could not depend on the white male, she could have her little sexual liaisons with the Negroes as she pleased. But still, in order to maintain white children, she had to be in control of that. She had to make sure the white children were safe. She had to make sure that the children would not be harmed by this evil unknown spirit. Now let's get deep about that spirit because that was heavy. When they were, let's, let's go back. When they were at the house with all the other people, there was some crazy guy who came in. They didn't know he was crazy at first and then they later found out he was crazy. He had this briefcase with him and I think he was from one of the, the crazy asylums or whatever, but he took out a bunch of pictures of what the demon looked like and the demon was dark it was all dark all black and that's the thing they they allow people to use their imagination in this film they would not show what the demon was or the spirit was but the spirit and the demon all we know is that it was dark the demon or the spirit and the energy was this dark black energy and when the dude pulled out the pictures, you know, he's it's all written in black ink. These 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 dark black images, I think it's my conjecture that that energy, that evil spirit, that evil entity. I think that could have represented melanin. If we want to go deep with it, if we really want to go deep with it. That thing could have represented melanin. You notice in all these movies, the threat is always dark. The threat is always, it's always a dark thing. And literally, the color black was the threat. It's the, the threat, you don't know what it is, but it's black. It's black, it's everywhere. You don't know how to stop it. It's black, it's in nature. And I'm thinking of that. I'm like, that's melanin. This black evil energy that can destroy whiteness. This black evil energy that will destroy whiteness when it's unchecked. 
this carbon. Notice it was all in nature. They would go out and the leaves would start rising up and the trees would start doing things and the wind, that's melanin, carbon, all that shit. It, it ties into carbon and melanin. Somebody in the chat room said, no, it's evil demons. That's what they think melanin is. Dark matter. That's what they think melanin is. They think melanin is evil because melanin can take them out. They think melanin is evil because melanin can take them out. That's why it was this whole thing with birth, them having birth with this melanin around and them protecting the babies with melanin around, them covering the babies with melanin around. They're closing the windows from sunlight. That's why they kept closing the window. It, it represented sunlight, all that shit. They had to cover the babies up from the sunlight and the melanin, all that stuff. Let me reach. Somebody in the chat room said I'm reaching. Well, damn it, I'm reaching then. That's what I'm reaching for. I'm going to reach to the stars. Carbon and melanin, damn it, go hand in hand. Melanin is all over the place. And remember, melanin, it's all in nature. Dark matter. That ain't reaching. That's not reaching at all. That dark matter, melanin, all that stuff is very significant and it's very metaphoric. And if you think I'm reaching there, let's let's reach some more. Let's do a little bit more reaching. Let's do some more reaching. And, and speaking of Tachulu, let's go back there because a lot of people say that that represented Tachulu by H.P. Lovecraft. That's his name. Lovecraft. The Tachulu character, because what the brother, what the white dude drew, it looked like some type of um, black octopus type of thing, which is what Tachulu is. Do you know, do you understand the works of H.P. Lovecraft? He was a stone cold white supremacist. H.P. Lovecraft was a major white supremacist. If you think I'm reaching, look at his background. These people had blackness on their minds at all times when they were writing this garbage. When they were writing all this science fiction, they were thinking about black folks. Read H.P. Lovecraft's views on black people. He was a major damn white supremacist. He couldn't stand black people. So these people had black folks in mind when they were re writing this stuff. Do you understand me? You better do the research. I'm not reaching these people. We stay on their minds. And it's always some kind of metaphor for us. When they write these novels and these books, you know, there, there, there's always some kind of racial undertone to it. Look, look at the movies. There's a reason why the black characters are sacrificing themselves and she was having sexual relationships with a with one black man who was controlled. He was a good Negro who could be controlled. But ultimately, you know, a good Negro is a Negro who will sacrifice his life so that you can survive. Meaning, if Negroes just off themselves and let the, the white supremacists survive, those are good Negroes. Those are good godly Negroes. You understand? You say black people weren't immune to the spirit. I understand that. These were some, they were sacrificial Negroes. They got sacrificed by the, the so-called evil spirit. But it wasn't about them. They still could have survived. They, remember, the black people in the movie killed themselves. They made a choice to kill themselves. They could have survived. That's the difference. The black folks in the movies, the characters, they could have survived if they wanted to. The black folks could have survived if they wanted to. They made a choice to sacrifice themselves for the white people. So always keep that in mind. But let's go even deeper. So since y'all think I'm reaching, I'm about to reach some more. I'm about to go Jacu Stowe deep. I'm about to go real deep. 
notice a lot of these movies are about white people dying because of some plague. It's always some plague, some kind of disease. What to do when one of these plagues hit you. A lot of that has to do with what's happening now that a lot of people in in these white supremacist enclaves around the country and even around the world, they're actually dying off for real. And over here especially, many white people in these white supremacist enclaves, they're dying off not because of some mysterious disease like they pretend. They act like they don't know why they're dying off. It's my conjecture that many of them are dying off from AIDS and HIV. And I've been talking about this for a few weeks. A lot of statistics that we know about AIDS and HIV, we're not being told openly. I'm going to say that again. It's my conjecture that AIDS and HIV affects people in white supremacist society more severely than they admit. Y'all keep hearing about all these places where white people are just dying off and they cannot reproduce and they act like they don't know where it's coming from. I believe a lot of that is HIV AIDS. But remember, They don't like to make white people the face of any type of disease because that makes a society look weak. When you look weak, you become vulnerable and then people will attack you. So they always have to put up their game face. So they'll act it out in movies. So they'll make it seem like some kind of extraterrestrial threat so they can learn how to deal with it on a subconscious level instead of directly dealing with it and putting it on them in real life. But I'm telling you, the AIDS and HIV is more rampant in white supremacist society than they let on because you cannot allow yourself to be the face of a damn disease. Let's go into AIDS again. I've been talking about it for a few weeks. Remember in the 80s, in the 80s, the face of AIDS and HIV were white men. Some of you might not be old enough to remember, but in the 80s, the face of AIDS was white men. White men were dropping dead left and right in the 80s because of AIDS. Some of y'all are too young to remember. I'm telling you, every other day a white man was dying of AIDS. And we're talking about prominent white people. Actors like Rock Rock Hudson, the dad from the Brady Bunch, several white porn actors, all of them were dying. John Holmes, all these people. Anthony Perkins, the actor, so many actors and singers, all these white people were dying because of AIDS. So what they had to do in the 90s, they had to change the face of it. They had to put an African face on it. They had to make it an African disease or black disease after Magic and Easy died from it. Then they started to do a PR run and change the face of it. Even now, when they report AIDS, if you look at the CDC website, They use very tricky, deceptive language about AIDS. What they'll say is 70% of the new cases of AIDS are black women. So you're thinking, oh damn, 70% of the sisters got AIDS. That's not true. They always use these little words to throw you off. They'll say the new cases here, 80% of the new cases, but they're not telling you the people who already got it, which are a lot of white people. All those white people from the 80s, where do you think the AIDS went? All those white people who had AIDS in the 80s, where do you think the AIDS disease went in their community? It didn't go nowhere. They play word games. I want y'all to understand this. And what they started doing with white people with AIDS, they, and y'all peep this, All they did was start calling it something else. What they did with all the white people who had AIDS and what they started doing, and they they definitely do it now, 
when they would pop up with AIDS, they'll just call that shit something else. So they'll make it seem like they have some kind of cancer or some kind of skin problem or whatever, but they won't call it AIDS. They were starting to already do that in the late 80s. When Liberace died, and I want y'all to research this, at first they tried to lie about what Liberace died of. Now, everybody knew Liberace was a flaming queen. He was fucking every boy he could find, every man he can get his hands on. So Liberace's doctor lied for him. They got outed because the doctor tried to send the death certificate in without sending it to the coroner. The coroner got a hold of it and then the coroner did an autopsy against the will of the the doctor and the the coroner said, hey, wait a minute, y'all trying to pull a fast one. This dude, they tried to say he had anemia. They tried to come up with some bullshit excuse while Liberace died and the coroner came out and I want y'all to look this up. I think this was around 1987. The coroner came out and said, hey, hey, y'all trying to pull a fast one. That motherfucker got AIDS. You dig? So they'll try to say pneumonia, lymphoma, heart problems, but it's all triggered by AIDS. They'll try to hide that. And they do that with a lot of white people who have it. And remember, a lot of the brothers who were getting it at the time, going back to the 80s, the brothers who were getting it were the ones who were laying up with these white dudes. Especially that whole Studio 54 crowd. Those black folks who was hanging around in that Studio 54 crowd with those cats, those were the ones who were getting it. Um, Gene Anthony Ray from the, the TV show Fame, that that singer Sylvester, he, he had it, he got it. Rest in peace to those brothers. I'm not saying that to disparage them. And Steve Rubell, one of the owners of Studio 54, he had AIDS. They tried to lie on his shit too. They tried to say he had something else. They tried to, when he died, it was pneumonia. They tried to run that same game too. They did the same thing with him too. Look up Steve Rubell. They tried to lie about what he had. You dig? But a lot of these dudes, there was a, a, a NASCAR racer in the a white NASCAR racer. He had it. I mean, just left and right, left and right. So those diseases didn't go nowhere. And recently with George Michael, a couple of years ago when he died, they still won't say what he really died. Of. We know what it is. They tried to say he died of fatty liver disease. Some bullshit. They keep changing it up. Now, George Michael, his lover, I think his lover got AIDS. The guy he was kicking it with. No, Freddie Mercury, he died of it. Yeah, a lot of these dudes. But with with George Michael, you know what it is. George Michael was out here performing oral sex in bathrooms on strangers in Beverly Hills. So a lot of these cats have it. They, the media and their doctors just lie for them. They know how to get on code. They understand the white supremacists all know how to get on code and cover shit up for each other. Just like with um, Charlie Sheen. Remember, Charlie Sheen outed himself. People in Hollywood knew Charlie Sheen had damn AIDS. They know everything. These people got access to all types of hospital records, medical records. They got access to all of that shit. They just know how to stay on code when need be. And they've been protecting Charlie Sheen for years. They've been protecting that dude for years. You dig? So they knew. They just didn't say nothing. So the thing is, the point is, there are a lot more people in white society who have AIDS than they're letting on. And this is why a lot of people, my conjecture, that they're dying off in these little white supremacist enclaves. And also, and I said this before, a lot of black folks who's out here swirling with Zaddy, with Freaky Zaddy, that's where a lot of black folks are getting it from. A lot of black immigrants, because a lot of immigrants like swirling with Zaddy, and that's where it's showing up at. It's showing up in a lot of these immigrants, and these immigrants get counted in as black folks. They don't get, there's no separation. So when y'all see these high number of AIDS popping up, you're like, hey, where's that shit coming from? It's these people laying up with Zaddy. 
and again, that goes back to these movies. These movies are teaching people how to survive if you get a quote unquote unknown disease. How do you survive? How does your offspring survive? How do you survive when you get a unknown disease and there's all this melanin floating around? When you get an incurable disease, you know you're gonna die. How do you put your children in a situation to survive with all of this deadly melanin, i.e. black folks, swirling around? You understand? I'm not reaching with these movies. These movies are metaphors, even The Walking Dead. There's always uh, white people trying to survive and there's some kind of demonic or zombie threat after them that they have to protect themselves from as they rebuild society. It is not a reach. Let's go back to the zombie movies and we broke this down in my film 1804, The Hidden History of Haiti. Remember, zombie movies, when zombie movies first started, all the zombies used to be Haitian. When they used to make zombie movies in the early 20th century, all the zombies were black. They made no bones about it. It was no, it wasn't even metaphoric. They said, these niggas are the threat. All the zombies used to be black. The word zombie is a West African word. The zombie, it all comes from voodoo. That's where the whole demonic spirit thing comes from. Blackness and demonic spirit, that's the whole voodoo thing. Zo, zombie on earth, Zo. Yeah, zombie is Congolese. So I'm not reaching on this stuff. They understand metaphors more than we do. They understand metaphors, and we got to understand metaphors. So don't think this movie got these pregnant white women, one of them named Olympia, you know, I'm picking up all on all that little stuff. These pregnant white women, one of them having sex with this brother. She's pregnant by a white man, having sex with a brother, having sexual relationships with a brother. And there's this dark, demonic energy swirling around in nature that's going to get them. And they have to protect their children from this dark matter and sunlight. They have to protect their children from this dark matter and sunlight. I mean, damn. The metaphors. You dig? So you got to understand how messages are sent to the dominant society. And we, we, we think a lot of stuff is just literal. But no, we got to understand how messages and metaphors are sent. And, and again, it's not a coincidence that both of the brothers in the movie were sacrificial Negroes. They sacrifice their lives to save white people. And that's what they're always telling us to do. In, in the system of white supremacy, they always want us to sacrifice our well-being for them. They always want us to, well, we got to live in the gutter. We got to be on the bottom for them. It's honorable to be on the bottom. It's honorable to be sacrificial. It's honorable. Remember, this just happened recently with the, the black kid who was on the all-white wrestle team the other day. Y'all remember that last week, this white kid? Not, this black kid was on a, a wrestling team, a high school wrestling team. A racist-ass referee made the black kid cut his dreads off. So he had to sacrifice himself so that the white people on the team could win. What would have been honorable was his white teammate saying, look, if our bro has to cut his hair, none of us are going to play. That would have been honorable. But they allowed that kid to sit up there and get humiliated while they cut his hair and gave him a pat on the back. You the man for sacrificing yourself and your dignity for us. That's how they look at us. They want us to sacrifice our dignity so that they can live nice. They want us to sacrifice our well-being so that they can live on top. 
and we're supposed to look at that as some kind of honor. Fuck that. No, thank you. Y'all better understand how this thing works and what they're trying to tell you. I ain't sacrificing nothing. If I'm in a situation like that, I'm going to survive. I'm going to survive and damn a flat screen TV. Y'all niggas get all the flat screen TVs you want. I'm not. I'm getting guns and cans of sardines and water. Y'all can keep your flat screen TVs. I'm stocking up. I'm stocking up on every gun I can find. Damn that, I'm surviving. I ain't sacrificing shit. You dig? And speaking of extraterrestrials, what's going on in New York right now? There was there was some something happening in, in New York. The sky turned blue or something out there. They said it was some kind of explosion in Queens somewhere at a plant. Some people said it looked like some aliens were coming. The sky was turning different colors. Are my New York people I? Right? Let me check. Yeah, man, my New York folks out there. There was something in New York City. I saw some pictures. It, it looked like Independence Day out there. They said it was some kind of explosion at a plant, but the sky was turning different colors. So let me know if any aliens come down there. Y'all better be careful and don't let them do an anal probe on you. Was it Ezekiel's will? And what's funny, in New York, New York, they, they them niggas don't be giving a damn, though. They can bring a spaceship down there, and the New Yorkers wouldn't even give a shit. Them niggas in New York be like, yo, yo, kid, what year is that spaceship, son? That's 2011. My cousin got a 2020, nigga. <laughs> the New York niggas always get shit in advance. They already got the 2020 spaceship. Nigga, that shit is old. I got a whole new one with a kid on it, nigga. That ain't shit, E.T. Fuck out of here with that wheel, nigga. <laughs> The New York niggas already got the 2020 spaceship and they stunting on the aliens out there. Yo, Rashad, look at this nigga E.T. with this old ass fucking spaceship, nigga. Tell that nigga I got Corinthian leather in mine, son. <laughs> oh my God, shout out to my New York family. Anyway, y'all, let me get out of here, man. But that's been today's episode of Tariq Radio. Um, y'all check the movie out, man. You know, I, I said a lot of spoilers, but go watch the movie again. Peep the metaphors. Peep all the secret messages and all that stuff. Anyway, you know what? Um, Go to, I'm going to have vinyl records for the Mink Slide album available on minkslide.com next week. A lot of folks have been asking about buying the vinyl album, so I have it for you guys on the website next week. But all my LA people, you can go down to Amoeba Music Store to check out um, the vinyl record. You can get the vinyl record right now if you are in LA. Go down to Amoeba Music on Sunset. You can get all the Hidden Colors DVDs there now. You can go there. I think they might be open now. Go there tonight or tomorrow, but you can get all that stuff at Amoeba Music on Sunset, ladies and gentlemen. And also go to our Mink Slide YouTube page to see a clip of one of our live performances or our live uh, one of the clips of the live performance we did in Atlanta you can see got that feeling we put that video up it looks real nice people like that you dig so y'all go to mink slide right here on YouTube and subscribe to this channel everybody before I go hit the like button and hit the subscribe button right now everybody hit the like button and hit the subscribe button right now, ladies and gentlemen, while we're right here chopping up game. Let's do that right now. Hit the like button and hit the subscribe button so you can get automatic updates on this channel when I go live, ladies and gentlemen. Where y'all at? I, I need to see most of y'all, more y'all hitting the live, the like button. Hit that like button. And again, 2019 is right around the corner. I hate dating the shows, by the way. I don't like dating the shows. But the new year is coming. Might have to do a new year show. 
What day is this? Okay. When is New Year's Day, guys? We might do a New Year's Eve show in a couple of days. What's up, Natural Charm? How are you? And everybody follow me on Instagram at Tariq Elite. And if you're a fan of Mink Slide Music, follow us at Mink Slide Music on Instagram. All right, guys. Y'all have a good one. We are out.